Welcome to the ROM's new conversation series, a new way of engaging museum visitors with the topics of our exhibits. These conversation-based programs are spaces where you can not only share your ideas with other participants, but in some programs, your feedback will help guide a conversation between the guest speakers. In this conversation cafe, the participants had conversations in breakout groups where they wrote down questions for the moderator to ask the artist. This is the recording of their conversation. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. So we all know that Taiba is born in Bangladesh. She is a multimedia artist and an activist who develops her practice through painting, printmaking, installation, sculpture, and video. She's inspired by the strong women of her childhood and her work addresses universal themes on the politics of gender and female identity. Taiba completed a Master of Fine Arts in drawing and painting at the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Dhaka in 1993. In 2000, she was an artist in residence at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin. She was awarded the prestigious grand prize at the 11th Asian Art Biennale Bangladesh in 2003. In 2011, she was appointed commissioner for the Bangladesh Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. And in 2015, her work featured prominently in the exhibition Frontiers Reimagined at the 56th Venice Biennale. In 2012, she was one of the curators for the Kathmandu International Art Festival. She also participated in the 14th Jakarta Biennale and the Colombo Art Biennale in Sri Lanka in 2011 and the Dhaka Art Summit in 2012. In 2002, uh, Taiba Begum co-founded the Brito Arts Trust, Bangladesh's first artist-run alternative artist platform dedicated to organizing exhibitions, encouraging intercultural dialogue, and providing residencies for local artists. Work by members of Brito Arts Trust was featured in um, Documenta 15 in 2022. Lippi's work is included in collections and exhibited worldwide in Australia, Bangladesh, Canada, here at the Royal Ontario Museum, Denmark, India, USA, and the UK. She continues to live and work in Bangladesh, and we are so honored to have her here today, all the way from Dhaka. Please give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have collected several amazing questions that, uh, that you have put together for us. And so Taiba, I think one of the recurring questions that, um, that we hear is first of all, talking about the two works in the exhibition um, that are more sculptural. Uh, Not For Me, which are the shoes, and um, Baby Frock which is the lovely, the little uh, girl's dress. So could we start just by talking about process, artistic process? Um, can you tell us a bit about how, how these pieces are made? Um, I think a lot of people, uh, I mean, thank you very much first, first of all, but a um, lot of people think that they are very sharp. Actually, they are not sharp at all. So I started um, working with Regis uh, in, uh, from 2008, and that happened in Pakistan for the first time. Oh. At that time, I used the uh, Regis from the uh, local market from Lahore. Um, and afterwards, when I thought about uh, reshaping them, like give them a different shape, for an object. I just found, uh, especially my partner is an artist and he's very good with the uh, like materials. So he told me that you cannot uh, bend them because these are not really stainless steel. 
uh, and they are breakable. So you have to think um, in a different way and you have to fabricate them if you want a ship. So that was before the Venice Biennale um, in 2011. So I made a uh, a, a huge rack with the uh, loss of uh, bras made out of razors. And so were those so were those bras made out of no, the real razor blades? No, no. Okay, they were all fabricated. They were fabricated. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So for that work, I started fabricating razors. Okay. So they are um, uh, made out of uh, like mold, one by one. Yes. And it. Um, it's not from the machine, it's like, you know, all handmade. Oh, wow. And I have got three different sizes. It's not only one size. And they are technically, they have different kind of holes or points where they are um, uh, like uh, welded together to make the shape. And I have a team, as I am not a welder, you know, I'm <laughs> And I don't, I'm, I don't have a strength to do it also. Uh, anyway, I have a team of welders um, in my studio who helps me uh, to do it, thanks to them. And um, they are the one who uh, actually uh, make the shape from the molds or from, yeah, mainly from the molds, yeah. But sometimes we do it uh, just straight to see the any object and we just replicate that object. That's also another thing. But m in most cases, uh, things are molded. Sometimes we, I am modeling them. Um, in recent days, uh, for my last exhibition, I just um, started uh, uh, doing uh, the object um, a bit bigger than the real size. Okay. Know? Not a bit, like a small button can be like this size. So, um, so um, it's like scaling up is another thing which uh, you have to think about, like following all the measurements and everything. And then um, go for the molding and then the, you know, all the things are done by hand. And there is this um, another machine which is doing this spot welding, but the frog you saw yes. is not really welded. Um, I have met the like you know we have met holes in it, and then there are like these you know chains. Links, yes. Yeah, there are links. Yes. So sometimes I do works like that. Sometimes they are welded. Most in most cases they are welded. Okay. So that's how it is. It's, it's a, a bit hard job actually to shape them. And sometimes, you know, I'm not happy with the shape and then I destroy the thing and do it again. So that happens. So it's a lot of time consuming work and it takes a long time. So if um, somebody is asking me for an exhibition, I cannot do it in like within a few days or a few months. I have to take time to do it because otherwise it's not possible. Because they're not all, then nothing is made by machine. Everything is by hand. And I know that, you know, we need time to do it. So that's how it happens. Thank that's you. the process. Thank you for that. The, the other question uh, somebody posed was, um, they, they've just seen the two sculptural works here, one lady's shoes and one a, a little girl's dress. What sort of other pieces have you made using razor blades and why? Your choice of subject. Um, I always uh, look at the objects around me. Um, so from my bed, whatever I see, from my childhood, whatever I saw, so everything comes to my mind. Like those old um, kind of um, furnitures, or um, sometimes maybe the bathtub, or sometimes a wheelchair where my mother, I saw my mother sitting oh. um, before she died, or my mother's dresser. So that kind of a small elements that is stuck in my mind from my childhood. Um, even now, uh, if I look at my own house, like I look at the things around me, I really love to do something with that. Just to memorize the whole thing. 
to, uh, because I'm in touch with this thing. I saw my, my, my mother's dresser from my childhood, mm -hmm. and I love to sit on the stool and you know, look at the thing. I asked my father about the story of that thing, and all the, like, you know, the um, furnitures, like the beds and all, where did you get them? So my father told, he was from the uh, railway um, department, so he told that his boss was uh, from uh, England. Um, for a long time. You know, the Britishers did all these things in um, South Asia, like the railway department they developed. So my father told that um, when my boss was leaving forever, for good, that time he told me that I have got these um, furnitures at home, and they are very old furnitures from my um, home, uh, because they brought everything from England. So. Um, do you think you like them? If you want, you can buy them or you can take them. So some of them my father bought and some of them were gifted by that boss. Mm. So we had that kind of furniture at home, okay. which was rare, I think, in, uh, you know, like in the, that kind of small town. Yes. So those things are not anymore like that dresser is still with me. I brought it from home. Um, but um, the other things are uh, all gone. So very interesting. You know. So I don't know if uh, everyone in the audience knows, but if you if you look up um, Taiba's work on her website, you'll see very large pieces of furniture made with uh, razor blades. And as she mentioned, a wheelchair, which I only just realized it's related to when your mother was was using the wheelchair. There, I've seen bathtubs, dressers. I've seen. Um, Women's underwear, yeah. um, and garments like you know all the crochet and all the other things like you know, um, yeah, and bags and, and your handbags, handbags I've seen as well, yeah. yeah. And all of these, so they all connect to their personal memories and their personal items. That yeah, are, do they? Um, is it almost like they they symbolize women particularly? Of course, they symbolize women particularly, but I tell you another story, like I have done a set of bikinis and a nighty also with the safety pins, that also I fabricate them in Bangladesh. Um, so uh, I love to buy them, the bikinis, but in Bangladesh, if you go through the, um, we have, a, I think, the longest sewage in Bangladesh, but you cannot, uh, jump into it with your bikinis, you know, you have to be full dressed and go there. <laughs> so that I hate, and uh, I love to buy them, but I never go th to the beach with them. So, so you have a whole set of bikinis, but you're not allowed <laughs> to swim in them. So okay, finally so I uh, just ended up to make my artwork out of them. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. excellent. Um, okay, now here's a question somebody has asked. How is your work perceived by women and people in Bangladesh? Are your artworks displayed in public places? Uh, not in public places. Um, I am never commissioned by, uh, Anna, to do any work in Bangladesh, especially. Um, but I, uh, my last show was in 2016. Uh, in, in, Dhaka. Bangla, in Dhaka, um, there was some trouble from the people because there was, I talked about this bikini piece, so there was a banner that Bengal Gallery uh, made for me, and that was outside the um, gallery, and then some people came into the gallery and then they complained. They said that you should take it out from there. Oh. Um, and they were asking for the, they were looking for the artist actually who did it. So they were um, angry, and I was there, but I did not tell that I'm the artist. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I just said that, yeah, it's uh, because just in front of Bengal Gallery, if you see, there is a, a um, big shop with um, like undergarments. Yes. So I told them there is undergarments around. So, so why this is bothering you? So that happened, you know. That happened. Then they looked at the shop and they said, yeah. Then <laughs> <laughs> they left. <laughs> uh, were they men by any chance, the people who questioned you or? 
Um, were they women as well? The women are, I think, uh, I think in most cases the women love my work. The women, sorry? They love my work. They love your work, yeah. yeah. Women love your work. Yeah. And they feel attached to it. So that's a big, I mean, um, that's a bliss for me. Yes. That they always come to me, hug me. And I think many of my works, um, with many of my works, they are connected. And mm. they feel like, you know, a, a very big connection with the work. Yeah. I think we all felt very, very connected <laughs> with your work here. Um, somebody raised an interesting point. Um, they said the male symbol is the razor, but then you make it out of a, then you make it into a, a feminine or a female uh, piece. And another person also raised the issue around the male gaze. There were several questions around the male gaze, um, particularly with respect to the high heels. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that someone raised that, okay, you've got um, a male symbol of the razor and then you have, you create these very feminine works, but sometimes uh, it's not only the razor that's painful, but it's, it's the shoe itself, and it's the, the pressure that sometimes women feel to look and dress a certain way. Um, just wondered where, whether any of these um, concepts were going through your mind when, when, you, were, when you make any of your pieces. Um, I don't have, like, you know, any experience about the offices, like how it works. Okay. But I, um, I think I, most cases, I saw the women wearing stilettos um, in the parties. At parties, yes. yes. Yeah. So, um, but I always find it very painful and I never, never, you know, never ever got chance to wear them. <laughs> I remember somebody gave me once, gifted me once, and then that was lying in my... You um, just yeah, didn't they, want to wear them. <laughs> didn't want. Yeah. Yeah. And I always wondered that um, how they wear it. But it also symbolizes the power of women. Okay. Like, it's painful, I know. And I'm sure that they are in pain as well. But I saw many of them are um, having like two pairs. One is <laughs> a slipper, and one is like that. And then they were wearing it when they need. Yes. So it's uh, with them in a car or somewhere you can find yeah. it. Yeah, they might be wearing their comfortable <laughs> shoes and then they yeah, slip yeah, yeah, on the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the high heels yeah, when, the high heels when, they, when need they need to. to. Yeah. So that's also happening. Um, yeah. yeah, of course, um, there is pressure, but Sometimes I find that it's also a like, choice of the women. Sure. Yeah, sometimes they want to be like They want that. to, yeah. yes. They want yeah. to, uh, from, yeah. Yeah, that's their choice. Thank you. Can we move on to the video work now, sure. home? So there's several questions. Um, what sparked your interest in interviewing and uplifting the hijra or transgender community in Bangladesh? Um, I was not familiar with hijras before I met Onarna. I only have experience seeing them on the street and asking for money uh, or maybe going to the houses where there is a, a Newborn, uh, newborn baby, child, or, newborn child, or a wedding, perhaps, or the wedding. Yeah, but in my hometown, I think I saw them from a f far off. There, there was a small community, but I was um, told that you know I should not go to closer to them because uh, they are a bit dangerous, or you know they can harm you, or. Um, something that is not right all the time, you know, every time. I, and afterwards I realized, so there was an exhibition at Brito that time, uh, in 2013. 
uh, curated by uh, my partner, Mabubur Rahman. And then um, uh, all the Brito members uh, were there. So I was thinking, and it, the topic was to um, uh, showcase uh, the, this community, all the communities, like LGBTQ. Okay. Uh, mostly. So, um, then, you know, I, a friend of mine was from Goethe Institute, um, who, uh, and the Goethe Institute had a project working with them. The Goethe Institute had in a Dhaka. project in Dhaka yeah, working in with Dhaka. transgender Tra communities. Transgender, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, the program director, the friend of mine, she, he was from the same uh, community. community. So that it was easy for me to talk to him. Yes. And then I said that, I just thought that, you know, I should not be scared anymore. I should, I should just break this ice and see, you know, just to learn, you know, how they live and who are they. Yes. Um, so I talked about someone else first, uh, who I met um, in a few months ago from that time. Uh, then he suggested me to talk to Anonya. To talk to Anonya. Anonya yeah. is the, uh, the, the protagonist of the, of the video, Home. Yeah. Right? So she, uh, she used to live um, in a suburb area of Dhaka city. Right. It's a bit far from my home. So I called her and oh, just suddenly she, she was like, you know, she was so excited and she said that, I'd like to uh, hear more about your project. Are you doing a documentary film? I said, no, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm not doing a documentary film. Um, first you come to my house and we just um, pour coffee and we talk about it. So, um, you know, they are not invited to your house. Like nobody invites them. Nobody invites them. them, no. So they are rejected by the society. So she was very happy. She could not believe that I am asking her to come to my house. Then she asked me if she could bring a friend of her. Okay. I said, yes, of course. So they both came to my house and we had coffee and we were just you know, relaxed and then, then we talked about the project. And then I said that it will be an interview, but I will be in uh, a, a part of this, the whole thing. So she couldn't realize at the beginning. Then I started doing some other projects with her. We had a sound piece also together. I'm singing there and she's dancing because oh. she's a dancer, but it's a sound piece. And I was a singer when I was a young. Oh, wow. <laughs> so anyway, that's another part of my life. Um, then, you know, I did a um, lot of other things with her and we started going to each other's place. So she was coming to my house or Brito, I was going to her house and a um, lot of engagements actually. So this is how we were connected. And then, um, since she was from old Dhaka, uh, she had a story about her own family. So I wanted her to um, take me to her home so that I can um, take her video. Then she said that I'm not welcome there. I'm not accepted by my family anymore. I can't go there. They will think that I'm, I have come to um, uh, ask for my you know, own rights, my own property. Oh, okay. I'm asking uh, you know, for yeah. my um, uh, part. Uh, my, from, yeah. My, yeah, they'll think that I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, there yeah, to yeah. ask for my inheritance. My yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so I don't want to go there. Okay. And my mother was the only person who supported me, who actually understood me. Uh, all my siblings didn't. So my Anonia had the support of her mom? Only mom, even not the father. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that happened. Then I chose the, another spot, which is like a very old uh, kind of boutique uh, hotel okay. for the publishers and the writers. And it's a historical place and it's the oldest one from old Dhaka. So I asked her to come here, come there to take that interview. For the interview. And, yeah. Oh, amazing, amazing. Okay, so I have another question. 
Oh, that's an interesting question. It's more, I suppose, for me, um, about the politics around visibility and that the video on um, transgender community was displayed in a kind of hidden corner within an, within an exit sign on the top. <laughs> uh, honestly, that wasn't, uh, you know, that wasn't the inten intention really to, um, we, you can see how awkward that gallery is. There are no straight walls. It's pretty much a nightmare. It's like a crystal, right? So it's like uh, uh, all of these bent walls. And we wanted the video to be as close as possible to Taiba's sculptural works. And yet, it's a video, so it has to be enclosed. It has to have a dark space around it, which is, which is why we had this weird corner. Um, I really love the corner. You like the corner? Very we much. wanted to create a kind of intimacy yeah. so that I have seen people sitting on that bench weeping, like I've actually seen people crying while they're watching that film. And I thought, you know, so there was a, a moment where people said, should we leave a tissue box there? Like, I, what do we do? And um, so in a way, it's a, it's a bit of a private moment. Um, I'm really sorry. With that exit sign, that's just the fire exit. Like you just have to have those things in your galleries. Uh, but we really weren't, we were not, at least even subconsciously, I was not trying to hide the story. Uh, I want to make that clear. Not that they're, you know, they're, I'm really glad that someone raised it because in the future, when I curate, I will think about that as no, well. No, I think that, was a perf that is a perfect place for the piece. Oh, thank because you. it's very quiet, you know, it's just in the corner, in a dark place. and. I think uh, that went to the whole thing, like this black and white. It, kind, it of, kind of, it kind of, it kind of. Okay, great, great. Um, One thing, just I want to add here. Actually, um, uh, to do this documentation, um, you can imagine, like it's it's a seven minutes um, video, but. Um, it took me whole day to, uh, like one whole day to take the interview of Anona. And many times while she was talking about herself, we both you know, were crying like anything. You know, because um, I couldn't take it, I didn't know. And she's almost like from my age. And I would just keep thinking about my life when I was in her age, while she was talking about the you know, abusement from the others, like how she was abused by the people, and what was her life while she was reject rejected by the family members to live with the unknown person when she was very young. So, um, so it it was really really hard for me to uh, take the video in one go. You can see, like you know, there are so many, like you know, little cuts. Cuts. Yeah, because it was so emotional, and I could not keep the whole thing because I know that it will be really uh, shocking for the yeah. people to yeah. hear everything. Yeah. Already this one is very shocking. It that, is, you know, it is. How she has You do, you it. allude to the abuse that mm. Anonya yeah. experienced as a child. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was really sensitively and, mm. and tastefully done. And, and one thing she was telling all the times that, um, you see, I am very colorful, but our life is black and white. So that's why, you know, I thought about, a, uh, you know, the video to be black and white. Is that why you chose yeah, for it to yeah, be black I and chose, white? Okay. I chose it. Amazing. Intentionally. Amazing. Yeah. Um, there is a much longer film, a feature length film with Anonia, but also broadly more about the transgender community. This, you produced that film, and your husband 
who is also an artist, directed that film. Can you tell us a bit about, I, I, unfortunately we didn't feature it in the public program, but there may be an opportunity in the future for us to show it at the ROM. Thank you so much. Um, actually, while I was doing um, this work with Onona, uh, my husband Mabub, he did another like video installation with her, but you cannot see Onona there. Because she was covered by a, a bed sheet. Okay. And it was like um, a mirror room, so that, you know, she was reflected everywhere. And uh, Mabub, uh, just uh, uh, kept the video on the top, okay. I mean, uh, camera on the top, so that Anona is like uh, sleeping, moving inside the... Like, under the bed uh, sheet. Under the bed, yeah. Okay. No, yeah, bed sheet. So um, anyway, after this project, uh, because Anona's project with me is not only this video. Okay. I did a larger project with her. You know, I did uh, many other works with her. So she was always connected with me, and I had a project in uh, Delhi at Shrine Empire Gallery, um, where the whole show was there, like, with Anonna. I took her to Delhi also, and I asked her to introduce me with the uh, transgender community uh, from Delhi. So they all came to the gallery. Um, it was a great experience for me. But after that, uh, Mabub decided that, you know, he wants to do a full-length film on uh, their community. So he started um, uh, a journey with Anonda for two to three years, I think. Oh, my. And then he made that film. Yeah. Oh, wow. So okay. um, Anonda coordinated the whole thing. Without her, it was impossible because, you know, the transgender, transgenders from Bangladesh, they are really very close to their uh, own community, like, you know, they, they are not open that much. They don't trust us. Of course. Because, you know, we, we are harmful people, you know, we make a lot of harms for them. So if, only if you are, uh, like, they trust you, they can do anything for you. So that's how, you know, we became friends with them. Then Mabu started shooting for these two, three years, you know, capturing their lifestyle all their ceremonies, even when they're uh, changing the, uh, their uh, organs, you know, that kind of, all these things are uh, captured in that, that films. So I became the producer, obviously, okay. <laughs> to support Brilliant. the whole thing. Brilliant. So the film was showcased in um, our duo at Broad Art Museum in Michigan for six okay. months oh, wow. in 2016. Okay. Then in Bangladesh, she didn't get a chance to uh, showcase this because, you know, there are a um, lot of um, unrest situations um, in between mm -hmm. in Bangladesh mm -hmm. uh, from this Muslim fundamentalist. There were lots of killings and all this, so Mabub right. decided not to not show Not to show that. it, okay. Um, then, um, during his exhibition, solo exhibitions, this time in Bengal Gallery, so they wanted to show that one. So this is the first okay. like kind of premiere show in Bangladesh. Wow, okay, um, thank you. I think last week, maybe. Yeah. Seb, how much time do we have left? Just so I... We have a couple more questions. Go ahead. 12 minutes. Okay. Sorry? 12 minutes. Um, okay, what, there was a question around the treatment of transgender people in Bangladesh where legally they, there is a third gender that was established in, was it 2014, 2013, something like this? No, before that. Even Be before, before that? Even before that, yeah. Way before that. Mm -hmm. And they are often invited to... I think in 2010, maybe. Was yeah. it 2010, as early yeah. as 2010? Yeah. So they are often, members of the community are often invited to sing and dance at the birth of a baby or at a wedding, for example. And they are actually invited to attend, right? Now, why is that? And then why is there... Apart from that, why are they discriminated against in society? Um, that culture is also disappearing. Yeah, you can find them um, begging on the street. You can find them 
begging on the streets. So there, there are. And many of them are sex workers. Okay. So that um, part of that, like you know, uh, that singing and dancing uh, um, sessions that they do, um, that was part of their uh, uh, like livelihood also. Like you know, they can earn some money. Earn some money out of yes. it. Yes. Yes. So if they are dancing. Uh, and they also go through this, uh, when there is a new baby born, they also go through, not because of entertainment, but because they want to check if the baby is from, you know, is the baby is like transgender or something. If, oh. So that they will take that baby with them. Right. So that's what, uh, that is traditional. Yeah. You know? And for the wedding, it's just part of the culture, yes. you know, part of their rituals or something. Yes. You know. um, we, we've also um, understood that because they are considered neither men nor women, they have a special, almost a special, they're in a liminal state. They're between, between genders and therefore they have a special connection to the divine. They're able to uh, bring blessings mm. upon yeah. the child, the baby, but also child the married couple. and the couple. new couple, newly married couple. And the newly couple. married couple, yeah. 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 In India, it's more, actually. That's yeah. more of a and tradition in, in India? Yeah. In Katma, yeah, I mean, um, Mabub did another project for the Kathmandu Triennale once, and yes. that was also from uh, for the uh, with the transgenders from Kathmandu. Okay, one transgender actually, who had two lives, so um, they um, they um, I mean they are not really um, a little complicated there, but I think India is more supportive to this community than any other then countries from South Asia. The final question we have is what's next for you, Taiba? What, is there something, are you working on similar things, completely different things? Uh, what's the future? Um, next month, I'm showcasing my work at the Thailand Biennale. So it's a bit different work because um, I have three sculptures there, but apart from those sculptures, they are um, all together, I think, embroideries, uh, how many? I think four, eight, nine of them. So it starts from small piece to a large one. The large one is around like 40 feet, 42 feet long and 13 feet high. That's a commission work by the Thailand Binale. So I was not there. I went there, of course, to um, see the uh, uh, venue and all this. So uh, it's in a museum, but it's happening actually in uh, different locations. And um, when I, but my works are in one museum. So when I saw that museum, I just found um, the old vehicles there. Mm -hmm. And um, I tried to uh, make the you know, whole thing together in one place. So those are not used anymore. And um, with the help of someone from there, um, in a prison, actually. The prisoners did the embroidery. Oh. So that's... Um, uh, can you hear her at the back? I know there's a fan, but she's so good, because she's talking about a very... She's doing embroidery now, <laughs> and she got uh, the prisoners of yeah. Thailand, in Thailand, yeah. to help embroider some of these pieces. Yeah. So that's the piece um, specially done for this exhibition. Wow. But they have chosen some of my old works that I started during the COVID. Okay. And um, first I started with the small pieces of uh, like, you know, look the paper, uh, look the um, fabric, 
Usually we know the Lokta papers are from um, uh, Nepal. They are handmade papers. Handmade paper. Uh, which is very famous. But uh, when I went into one paper industry, I just found some fabrics there. And I said, that, what is made out, made of this, you know. And then they said, this is also Lokta. So, oh, really? So they are very much like Nate. You know, not really okay. uh, fine fabrics. So during COVID, um, when there was nothing to do, especially, you know, you cannot um, interact with the people, so what you can do? You just go through your own studio, find your, own, your remaining uh, staff or your remaining materials, and then you start doing something else. So that was a good time to start with this um, the series of works. works. Oh. Yeah. So I did six pieces by myself. It took me a long time because they are not really good fabrics. <laughs> But then, you know, um, I um, sent uh, uh, bigger pieces of silk um, to, uh, to the village women in mm -hmm. Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And I sent the drawing to them, how to draw it. And then, you know, we used to talk over the phone and sometimes they were sending the pieces and then I could tell that, you know, it's not the right one, you can just do this thing, that thing. So that's how we did the four other pieces. So these four and uh, those works and all together is going for the Wonderful. Thailand Biennale. But I started another series of work with the jewelers. Oh. So making jewelries out of rages. Oh, so they, wow. are, they will be the bigger jewelries than the normal. Oh, I can't wait to see that. Jewelry, jewelry made out, out yeah. of razor blades. Yeah. Okay, we're <laughs> looking forward to seeing that. Will we, will we be able to see any of your embroideries online? Um, I think so, yeah. If we yeah. look up the, tha the Thailand, Thailand Biennale? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, that's great. I think they are going to put up some, some of them. Okay, mm. great. Well, we look yeah. forward. I'm definitely going to search them up. Thank you so much, Taiba. Thank you very for much. For spending the whole day with us in the freezing cold. <laughs> Missing the Santa Claus parade. Yeah, only one complaint about the cold. You know, my sister is there. She's always, um, you know, teasing me that, oh, you are too cold all the time. And I said that you come to Bangladesh, I will yeah. tell you the same. Yeah. That you are too, uh, you are feeling too hot. Hot all the time. <laughs> Wonderful. Everybody, please, a round of applause to our artists. Thank you. <laughs>